Stanford University. It's that scene that if you were to pass a needle through an intercostal space, by uh, providing you keep near to the upper border of the rib, you're unlikely to damage an intercostal nerve. However, if you pass close to the lower border of the rib, you might well damage an intercostal nerve. And this would result in paralysis of the intercostal muscles, and in the lower intercostal nerves, if they were damaged, would also result in damage and, and paralysis of the abdominal muscles. Now, I'd like to complete this cross-sectional drawing for a moment by putting in the skin and the subcutaneous fat and perhaps just indicate the position of a muscle here that's attached to the outer surface of the rib, the serratus anterior muscle. And then, for sake of completion, uh, put in the costal layer of parietal pleura coming round on the inside. And you can see that if you uh, put a needle through here in order to do a thoracocentesis and connect this up to a syringe, you are going to pass this needle through the following structures. The skin, the superficial fascia, the serratus anterior muscle, the external intercostal muscle, the internal intercostal muscle, the transverse thoracic muscle, and then the parietal pleura. And it's at this point that you enter the pleural cavity. If you were to go on passing the needle through, you would cross the pleural cavity and start entering the visceral pleura and the lung. It's very important, as a student of medicine, you should know the various structures that a needle perforates when uh, performing a thoracocentesis. For sake of completion, I'll just add another small branch of this nerve which runs down just below it. It's called the collateral branch of the intercostal nerve. It is running with the main intercostal nerve at a slightly lower level. Well, now having uh, understood then the contents of intercostal space, clearly we've got to understand the function of these muscles. How do we, in fact, take a deep breath? When we breathe in, it is an active process and requires the fixation of the upper ribs of your thorax by means of the muscles of the neck, the sclenus anterior and the sclenus medius. Having fixed the first rib, then when we contract these muscles lying between the ribs, we pull the ribs up closer to one another, rather like the compression of a concertina. We are pulling them up together and we are elevating the ribs towards the first ribs, first rib, which is fixed by the neck muscles. By doing this, the ribs are elevated, the sternum is thrown forwards, and the bucket handle action of the ribs as they are raised increases the transverse diameter of the thorax. At the same time that these intercostal muscles are contracting and raising the ribs, the diaphragm is contracting and the cupoli, the domes of the diaphragm, are becoming flattened out and descending. So that we have increased the anteroposterior diameter of the thorax, we've increased the supro-inferior diameter of the thorax, and by the bucket handle action of the ribs, we've increased the transverse diameter of the thorax. And so air enters the trachea and the lungs expand. Expiration is a passive phenomenon and is largely brought about by the elastic fibers, elastic tissue present within the lungs. All the muscles involved in inspiration merely relax. If one forcibly inspires, one uses any muscle one can outside the thorax in an, in a, in an attempt to raise the ribs. For example, you can use the pectoral muscles, and uh, you can use the sternocleidomastoid in the neck to pull up the thoracic cage in a massive attempt to inspire. If you want to forcibly expire, you can contract the muscles coming up to your lower ribs, namely the abdominal muscles, and also the quadratus lumborum, and pull down the ribs, and so help the lungs to um, exhale. 
inspiration is an active process and expiration is a passive process. Uh, Dr. Snell, I believe I understand the your description of the difference between the pleural cavity and the thoracic cavity, but I wonder if you'd mind explaining it again, since for most of us we've considered the two synonymous. Yes, the thoracic cavity is the cavity within the entire thorax, bounded behind by the vertebral column, bounded at the sides by the thoracic wall, and bounded in front by the sternum. Now, the development of the lungs uh, has resulted in the laryngotracheal tube growing down in the septum and then pushing out the pleura in such a way that we have the lung covered with visceral pleura, which is the dark blue, which comes into almost touches the parietal pleura, which is the light blue. And during this process, the space between these two layers of pleura gradually becomes less and less. And it is this potential space which is recognized as the pleural cavity and contains just a film of moisture which allows the two layers of pleura to move upon one another uh, during inspiration and expiration. So the thoracic cavity is the entire cavity. The pleural cavity on each side is this little potential space between the visceral and parietal layers of the pleura. Thank you. Now, I wonder if you would also explain to me the anatomical basis for the fact that occasionally we see patients who suffer from upper abdominal pain and even upper abdominal spasm who on study are found to have pneumonia or a supradiaphragmatic disorder of some sort. Uh, yes, this can be explained on the basis of understanding the distribution of an intercostal nerve. Uh, the upper six intercostal nerves uh, pass round in the intercostal space and innervate the skin over the intercostal space, the muscles of the intercostal space, and the parietal layer of pleura. Uh, clearly, in this region, uh, any condition inside the lung would be, once it traverses the pleural cavity, involves the parietal pleura, would be felt in the dermatomal region. Now, on the other hand, when we consider the lower intercostal nerves, from uh, six on downwards, uh, we find that, for example, the seventh intercostal nerve comes round into the abdominal wall, and the eighth, and so on. And this would mean that these nerves would not only supply the areas here in the thorax, but would also supply the skin of the anterior abdominal wall, the anterior abdominal muscles, and the parietal peritoneum, so that a lesion involving the parietal pleura in the lower part of the thoracic cavity may give rise to referred pain which would go down into the anterior abdominal wall and involve the dermatomes in that region. In other words, that pain would be interpreted by the patient as pain in the abdominal wall That's rather right. than along yes. the, the uh, side. So the pain may extend region. down from the thorax into the abdominal wall. Could you tell me something about the sensibility in the visceral pleura? What yes. is the source of that sensibility? Well, the visceral layer of pleura, uh, which c c closely covers the uh, lung, uh, is innervated by sensory nerves which run with the autonomic nerves and go up with the sympathetic and the vagus uh, to the central nervous system. They are essentially sensitive to stretch, so that uh, the visceral pleura is only sensitive to stretch, whereas the parietal pleura, on the other hand, is sensitive to pain, temperature, touch, and pressure, and is supplied by the intercostal nerves. In the living individual, is the mediastinum fixed? Does it uh, switch? from one side to another as, as pressures change, or does it remain fairly rigidly fixed between the vertebral column and the sternum? Yes, I'm glad you asked that, because in the dissecting room, of course, the, the mediastinum is a fixed structure because of the fixation process. Uh, in the living subject, in fact, the mediastinum containing the heart, uh, the great blood vessels, and the esophagus, and so on, uh, they can, in fact, move this partition of pleura to one or either side. In other words, as the heart's beating, so the, uh, the pleura will move, and as the esophagus distends with a large bolus of food, so it will move. Uh, clearly, if the, the lung was to collapse on one side, then the mediastinum could shift over, and uh, quite uh, to a large extent, 
And this could be detected in the living subject by the fact that, that your trachea moves over, and of course your heart moves over, and your apex beat of your heart would move over. And so you can detect that shift. Yes, it is a mobile structure in the living. Thank you very much. Well, now we've discussed the thoracic wall, and we understand that there is a thoracic inlet and a thoracic outlet. And we understand that there is a partition which extends backwards from the sternum to the vertebral column, known as the mediastinum. Now, what I propose to do now is attempt to draw the mediastinum, starting off with the vertebral column posteriorly and gradually working forwards until we put in the sternum. Now, to do this, we must first of all put in the anterior surface of the vertebral bodies. And I'm going to indicate the one side of the vertebral column, the other side of the thoracic part of the vertebral column, and then just indicate the position of the intervertebral disc. So this is the first thoracic vertebra, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth vertebra down here. And then we must realize that at the side of the vertebral bodies, we have the ribs passing out, remember the uh, arching out on either side, the heads of the ribs, coming out in this sort of manner on either side. Like that. And then we can place down the front of the vertebral bodies the anterior longitudinal ligament, which is strongly tethered to the edges of the vertebrae and to the intervertebral discs. So this is the anterior longitudinal ligament coming down. Now, if we put in the position of the aorta, we realize that the arch of the aorta is curving backwards and becomes continuous with the descending thoracic aorta at the disc between the fourth and fifth uh, thoracic vertebrae. Now, this is the one, two, three, four, just indicate that, and this is fifth. We know that the descending thoracic aorta begins at about this level on the side of that disc between the fourth and fifth uh, thoracic vertebrae. Now, from this point onwards, downwards, we're going to see that the descending thoracic aorta will gradually migrate towards the midline. In fact, it will eventually reach the midline and pass through the diaphragm at the level of the 12th thoracic vertebra. We say pass through. In point of fact, what we mean is that it passes down behind the diaphragm. So this is all the descending thoracic aorta, gradually moving over towards the front of the vertebrae. Now, this large artery will give rise to the intercostal arteries. That is, the intercostal arteries below the second. So we can just bring off here uh, the third inter post intercostal artery and then indicate the fourth and so on, like this, coming down in the intercostal space in the way that we indicated previously. The first two intercostal spaces will be supplied by the deep cervical artery, which is a branch of the second part, the subclavian artery. And this comes down in front of the neck of the first rib and gives off the first post intercostal artery and then goes on down and supplies the second intercostal space. So we put in here then the posterior intercostal arteries. And the same thing applies here. The first and the second intercostal arteries are supplied by the deep cervical uh, artery, a branch of the costo cervical trunk, branch coming off the, first, the second part of the subclavian artery. Now these intercostal spaces here will be supplied from the aorta in this manner. coming across the midline and supplying the intercostal spaces. Now, having put the arteries in position, uh, I think we should place in position the veins. As you remember, we said 
the order of the structures lying in the intercostal space is vein above, artery, and then the intercostal nerve. So we'll put in here the first intercostal vein, post intercostal vein, which passes upwards and is drained into the veins of the neck. And then uh, we're going to put in other veins, which are going to come into the azygos system or the superior left intercostal vein, which will just leave uh, hanging there for the moment. But from here on downwards, we have the azygos system. We have an azygos vein here, which is going to curve forwards above the root of the lung and going into the superior vena cava. And with a hemiazygos system, which is on the other side, and we'll just indicate its position down here, going on down, and it communicates across the midline about the level of the eighth, seventh or eighth thoracic vertebrae. It's bearable. So that these veins here will drain across in this manner into the azygos system. Vein above the artery in each case. Going across like that, going into the hemiazygos system on that zone. Well, now we mustn't forget that coming round in each intercostal space, we have the intercostal nerves. And they're much closer across to the rib above than I've indicated, but they're lying in this intercostal space below the artery and the vein. And running down in front of the heads of the ribs on each side and gradually moving towards the front of the vertebral column, we have the sympathetic trunk. And we'll put it in in this manner. This being the fused, superior, uh, inferior cervical sympathetic ganglion with the first thoracic sympathetic ganglion forming the stellate ganglion. And then we come on down having the characteristic expansion as we're going on down each segment having uh, a ganglion. And gradually we're moving towards the front of the vertebral body. First of all, starting in front of the, the ribs, next to the ribs, and then coming on down, gradually moving immediately towards the midline, of course disappearing behind the aorta there, and then coming on down like that. Now, the, each of these sympathetic ganglia will be connected to, an in, to a spinal nerve by a white ramus lying laterally and a gray ramus lying medially. Now there's another structure that is passing up in this region, right hard up against the vertebral column, is the thoracic duct. Now the thoracic duct begins below as an expansion called uh, the cisterna chile, and this is found below the level of the diaphragm, and the thoracic duct comes up through the diaphragm uh, in company with the aorta. And we find the thoracic duct coming up in this manner and then gradually crossing to the other side and passing up in this manner. I'm putting it in this way with some sort of wavy arrangement to indicate the dilatations and constrictions, which is characteristic of this large lymphatic duct, uh, the constrictions occurring above and below the valves. It's a, a multiple valves, bicuspid valves, all the way up this thoracic duct. And of course, as it gets up into the neck, it curls round and is going to join the great veins of the neck. So here's the thoracic duct. So let's just take stock of the position as we see it now. The most posterior structure is the bodies of the, the thoracic vertebrae. In front of that, we have the anterior longitudinal ligament. Then we have the region where we have the intercostal arteries and veins, and the azygos system and the hemiazygos system. And in front of that, we have the thoracic duct. Now, the next logical structure to put in position is the esophagus. Now, the esophagus uh, becomes continuous with the pharynx at the level of the sixth cervical vertebra. And its ultimate aim is to go through the diaphragm at the level of the tenth thoracic vertebra. So that it's going to come down and is going to ultimately go over in this direction. But the arch of the aorta keeps it pretty well central to begin with, and it is only later that it sweeps across to go through the diaphragm. So we'll just begin 
with the esophagus cut across there, and we'll show it coming down here with the thoracic duct just being seen to one side, and we're coming on down to the region of the arch of the aorta, where the arch of the aorta becomes continuous with the descending thoracic aorta, and then we're going to sweep it over now towards the left side, where it passes in front of the descending thoracic aorta. Now, rather than continue with that, I would like to put in uh, the diaphragm, a little part of it anyway. You will remember that the central tendon of the diaphragm lies in front of uh, the ninth thoracic vertebra. So this is the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. So we can put the central tendon coming across in this region. And then we can indicate the cupola of the diaphragm on the right side uh, coming arching up like this here and the left cupola of the diaphragm. We can now show a part of the structure of the diaphragm below this level. We can show the fibers coming up from the lower ribs in this sort of manner and on the other side in a similar manner. And then we must remember that uh, arising from the front of the vertebral bodies below the diaphragm, we have the right and left crua of the diaphragm. And I'm just going to indicate the upper position of the crus here, which will encircle the esophageal opening. And I'm just going to indicate it in that sort of way and indicate an opening here through which the esophagus is going to pass. All right, well now, we have drawn in the esophageal wall coming down, and we will pass it more and more over to the left as it's coming down in front of the descending thoracic aorta, and then we shall see it coming through here and emerging and expanding out as it goes into uh, the uh, stomach at the gastroesophageal junction. So that we can see that the posterior relations of the esophagus, as it is lying in the posterior mediastinum, uh, are as follows. The vertebral column with the anterior longitudinal ligament. We've seen the posterior intercostal arteries. We've seen the azygos veins. We have seen the thoracic duct. And we've seen the descending thoracic aorta. And gradually the esophagus will pass over more and more to the left and finally go through the diaphragm at the level of uh, the 10th thoracic vertebra. So let us now remove the posterior relations of the esophagus. And as I'm doing so, I'll remind you that the upper part of the esophagus has a blood supply from the cervical arteries, mainly the inferior thyroid artery, and the middle part of the esophagus has a blood supply from the descending thoracic aorta, and the lower part of the esophagus has a blood supply uh, from uh, the left gastric artery, a branch of the celiac artery. I remind you also that we have the longitudinal fibers of the esophagus on the outer surface, and the esophageal fibers are in the upper third, are striated voluntary muscle. In the middle third, it's mixed striated voluntary and involuntary muscle, and the lower third is entirely uh, smooth involuntary muscle. And here's the opening of the esophagus down below, it's going into the esophagus, uh, from the esophagus into the stomach. Well, now, having put this massive tube in, in front of the descending thoracic aorta, I think we should bring down the trachea. Now, the trachea is lying here in front, and you remember it is a membranous tube which is kept patent by the presence of horseshoe-shaped uh, bands of hyaline cartilage. And I'm just indicating the horseshoe shape uh, of these cartilages, and they help, help to keep this membranous tube open. And this trachea in the adult is about four and a half inches long, and it comes down in front of the esophagus, and it's passing over towards, slightly over towards the right. And at the level of the disc, between 
T4 and 5, which is, if you remember, the division between the superior mediastinum and the inferior mediastinum, we find that the trachea uh, bifurcates into form the right and left bronchi. Now, the right bronchus is a more direct continuation of the trachea. The left bronchus is smaller and goes across at an angle and goes across the arch of the aorta. And it lies right in front of the esophagus in that sort of way. So that we can now erase those parts of the esophagus that we can see through the trachea and the other structures that lie posterior to the bronchi. Now we have here one ring, and then we have the other rings coming round, and then we have the region of the carina where the bifurcation occurs, and then we have the other rings in this sort of manner. And lying between the rings, of course, is the membranous part of the trachea, the fibrous membrane, and going into the bronchi. And then just for sake of completion, we can put the first uh, bronchi, hip arterial bronchus, as it's sometimes called, coming off there and coming off in that direction. So there is then the trachea. Tube, four and a half inches long, and completed posteriorly by this membrane containing within it the tracheolus muscle. So that we'll cover this with the mucous membrane on the inside. And there's the upper cut edge. You've got to bear in mind, of course, the trachea begins above by being continuous with the larynx at the level of the sixth cervical vertebra. So here it comes down in the midline, then gradually moves over towards the right, and at the level of the disc between T4 and 5, it bifurcates into the right bronchus, which is the more direct continuation, and the left bronchus, which is going across to the left. Well, now, having put that in position, I think we should carry over the arch of the aorta. Now, the arch of the aorta is a direct continuation of the ascending aorta at about the level of the disc between T4 and 5. So this is the, the beginning of the arch of the aorta, and it comes up and arches across in this sort of manner. Cross the terminal part of the trachea. And we can erase the structures that lie behind it. This is the arch of the aorta, a direct continuation of the ascending aorta. So here is the aorta now lying in front of the lower part of the trachea. Now we can immediately see that we can put in the main uh, branches of this arch as they ascend into the neck. We have here, coming up on this side of the trachea, the brachiocephalic artery. coming up on the right side of the trachea. And then on the left side of the trachea, we can put in the left common carotid artery. And then behind, because you've got to bear in mind this is arching posteriorly to get, come continuous for the descending thoracic aorta, we have the left subclavian artery. So just so that we can get those boundaries clear, let me just indicate the margin in this sort of way. And then come up here for the brachiocephalic artery. And that way. So you can see how the trachea is embraced by these two large arteries coming off the arch of the aorta. Now we must bear in mind that coming down, we have uh, the subclavian vein on the right side uniting with the internal jugular vein, and so we have the brachiocephalic vein here on this side of the brachiocephalic artery, 
and this comes down and unites with the brachiocephalic vein coming across from the other side to form the superior vena cava. So here's the superior vena cava now coming down on this side of the aorta. Here's the left brachiocephalic vein coming across. And of course the inferior thyroid veins are coming down from the neck to drain into that uh, left brachiocephalic vein. Well now I think we're in a position to put in the pulmonary trunk. Now the pulmonary trunk has come up from the right ventricle and it passes upwards backwards into the left and almost at once bifurcates to give rise to the two pulmonary arteries. One going over to the left and the other one coming over to the right. Just show a little bit of it here and make it in solid. So here's the pulmonary trunk coming out of the right ventricle, containing deoxygenated blood, dividing up into the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. Let me just outline the margins of that. There we are at the moment. Now immediately you think of the pulmonary trunk and the arch of the aorta, you should be thinking of the ligamentum arteriosum. And the ligamentum arteriosum extends from the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk across to the arch of the aorta. And now we're in a position to put in some of the important nerves that are descending from the neck. Let us take the vagus nerve. Now the vagus nerve is coming down in the carotid sheath, you remember, in the neck, uh, following the common carotid artery. And on this side we can follow it down here and it comes on to the arch of the aorta and it's ultimately going over a bit to the left there and then passing behind uh, the root of the lung and which of course so there is the left pulmonary artery coming off and it'll come in behind there and contribute to the pulmonary plexus and then it'll come on down and come onto the anterior surface of the esophagus and contribute to the esophageal plexus finally coming out into the abdomen in front of the esophagus as the anterior gastric nerve. Now, as it's crossing the arch of the aorta here, it gives off a very important branch, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is going to go up back into the neck and supply all the muscles of the larynx except the cricothyroid muscle. It is also going to supply the sensation to the lower half of the larynx and the upper part of the trachea. So let us get this nerve in position. This nerve, in order to run up into the neck, comes off the vagus nerve and passes behind, underneath the arch of the aorta to the left of the ligamentum arteriosum. And once it gets behind there, it comes into the region of the groove between the trachea and the esophagus, and so it'll pass up behind here, and we shall see it coming up here in the interval between the trachea and the esophagus. Now, on this side, we have the uh, brachiocephalic artery, and the vagus nerve will go down behind here, and by, along the side of the trachea, and of course will come down uh, behind the root of the lung here on this side, the right side, contribute to the pulmonary plexus, and then go down behind the esophagus, and form the posterior esophageal plexus, and then we'll come down into the abdomen behind the esophagus to form the posterior gastric nerve. Now the next uh, nerve that I'm going to bring down is the phrenic nerve. Now the phrenic nerve has come off the sclenus anterior in the neck and is coming down in front of the subclavian artery and it also is reaching the region of the arch of the aorta. And it's just here that we have the superior left intercostal vein, which is draining the second and third spaces, coming across and going to drain here in this sort of manner into the veins that are lying here. And this vein separates the phrenic nerve from the vagus. Now, I'll leave the phrenic nerve there because it's going to go down the side of the pericardium 
uh, onto the, to supply ultimately the diaphragm. The phrenic nerve on this side is going to come down behind the superior vena cava and is going to run down the side of the pericardium. So that we're now, I think, in a position to put in the st very important structure that lies between this point here and the diaphragm, namely the pericardium and its contained heart. So let us just outline the size of the fibrous pericardium. It will extend from this point here down to the central tendon of the diaphragm, where it will fuse with the central tendon. It will then come across and rest on the upper surface of the left cupola of the diaphragm, and then it will curve round the apex of the heart and come up in this region here, across the aorta, right up to this area here, right up here, and come across and become continuous with this right margin of the heart. Now, the right margin of the pericardium, of course, is coming down here, as I've indicated, and it goes across here. Now, you can just see the, the names of the structures there that lie behind the pericardium. We have the esophagus and the descending thoracic aorta, and behind these structures, the vertebral column. So let us now erase the structures that lie behind here, but not completely. Let's leave them very faintly uh, in position. Let me just leave a little bit of the outline of the esophagus here. And bring down the superior vena cava. And the superior vena cava is coming down here, in front of the right pulmonary trunk, and it's coming through the fibrous pericardium, and it's going to go into the right atrium. So we shall see it there. We can show here the inferior vena cava going up through the diaphragm at the level of the eighth thoracic vertebra and coming into the pericardial cavity here, eventually entering uh, the right atrium. We can show here the ascending aorta which is lying in that position with the trunk of the pulmonary artery lying in front. And we can show the aorta coming down there and of course we can show the orifice at the lower end here where it's coming out of the left ventricle. And here's the orifice here of the pulmonary trunk. Now, going, rather, coming back from the lungs on either side, posteriorly, we have the pulmonary veins on the right side and the pulmonary veins on the left side. So that now we're really in a position to put in the visceral pericardium, the visceral and rather the serous pericardium. Here I put in the fibrous pericardium in green. Now we'll put in the serous pericardium. Now the serous pericardium comes around and lines the whole of the fibrous pericardium and is reflected off the wall of the pericardium around these vessels. And so we have a sheath around here, which is encircling the pulmonary trunk and the ascending aorta, and we have another sheath which encircles the veins. In this manner. So that if we now put in, indicate the posterior wall of the pericardium, serous pericardium, we can show it this way. Again, I'm just leaving a little bit of the esophagus showing in the background, behind. Now you may ask, where is the serous pericardium going? 
It's coming off the posterior wall of the pericardial cavity. Where is it going? It is going onto the back of the heart. And it's going, as you see, as a sleeve around the great arteries, namely the pulmonary trunk and the ascending aorta, and another sleeve around the veins. And this, these two sleeves enable us to describe two anatomical situations. One is up here, which is referred to as the oblique sinus, because it's going obliquely upwards behind the heart. And the other one is this gap here between the sleeve around the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk and the sleeve around the veins. And since this is going across, we call this the transverse sinus. So here is the oblique sinus, and here is the transverse sinus. Well, now we're in a position, I think, uh, to put in the heart itself. And to begin with, I'll put in uh, the outline only, and we'll come along like this. The, uh, the left margin of the heart here being formed by the left ventricle, the apex of the heart being formed by the left ventricle. Now we're coming into the region of the lower margin of the right ventricle. Now we're in the region of the right atrium, and coming up here in this sort of manner. And now I can erase these structures. Note that the esophagus still can be seen and is lying behind the heart and behind the pericardium. In fact, it is lying behind the left atrium of the heart, as we shall see. But having erased these posterior structures lying behind the pericardium, we can put in the main part of the heart, the lower margin of the heart, the diaphragmatic surface of the heart is underneath here, the apex of the heart formed by the left ventricle, the left border of the heart formed by the left ventricle, and then we can come over to the upper margin of the heart and come down on this side here, the right margin of the heart formed by the right atrium. Now, what we must realize, of course, is that there is, in fact, a groove down the front of the heart here called the interventricular groove, and this denotes the division between the right and the left ventricle. There's also a groove down the front here which denotes the division between the right atrium and the right ventricle. Now, we mustn't forget that over here we have the right auricular appendix which is a little diverticulum of the right atrium, which protrudes round this margin of the heart. And from around here, we have a protrusion from the left atrium, called the left atrial appendix. So we can see that the pulmonary trunk, which is emerging from this right ventricle and coming out in this way, is coming out of this part of the right ventricle. Well, now I think we're in a position to ask ourselves what's happened to the serous pericardium. You saw here how we had a serous pericardium lining the fibrous pericardium, and I went to great lengths to explain to you how the serous pericardium is reflected off the back of the fibrous pericardium, around the great vessels, around the arteries, and around the veins. Now what happens when the serous pericardium reaches the heart itself? Well, it becomes the visceral layer of serous pericardium. And I'm just going to indicate it to you in this way as a separate layer that's coming round within the other serous layer. In fact, to distinguish between the two, we can say the light blue layer is the parietal layer of serous pericardium, and the purple layer that I'm putting in is the visceral layer of serous pericardium. Now, I want you to appreciate that just as in the case of the pleural cavity, the pericardial cavity is this little potential space that lies between these two, the, the, the light blue and the purple layers of um, the drawing. In other words, the pericardial cavity is this potential layer, the potential zone between the um, parietal layer of serous pericardium and the visceral layer of serous pericardium. And there's a small amount of fluid that exists as a sort of film over the surfaces of the two layers of serous pericardium and allows the beating of the heart to take place in here without 
causing friction between the two layers. Well, uh, let's just uh, indicate then, this is all uh, the front of the heart here, the front of the right atrium here, the front of the right ventricle here, and the front of the left ventricle here forming the apex of the heart. Now, what can we see running down the front? Well, a very important artery comes down the front, having arisen from the anterior surface of the ascending aorta. And it comes around here and is embraced between the right auricular appendix and the pulmonary trunk. And it's coming down, and it's coming down here. And this is the right coronary artery. And the right coronary artery passes down in this groove, reaches the lower margin, and then if I could just indicate where it is going, in the undersurface of the heart in that manner, it turns around and runs still in the atrioventricular groove on the undersurface of the heart, and then gives off a large posterior interventricular branch. So this is the right coronary artery, arising from the front of the ascending aorta, coming round the right margin of the pulmonary trunk, between the pulmonary trunk and the right auricular appendix, coming down in the atrioventricular groove between the right atrium and the right ventricle, reaching the lower margin of the heart, and then passing up underneath, and then uh, in, still in the atrioventricular groove, and then giving off this posterior interventricular artery. Now, in a similar manner, coming across, uh, arising from the ascending aorta on the left posterior surface, is the left coronary artery. Now, the left coronary artery is coming around here, and at the point where it is disappearing onto the back of the heart, to an astomose with a continuation of the right coronary artery, it gives off a very large branch called the anterior interventricular artery. And this passes down in the front of the heart, reaches the apex, and then turns round and anastomoses with the posterior interventricular branch of the right coronary artery. Now, this is so important that I'm going to go through this again. The right coronary artery arises from the anterior surface of the aorta just above the aortic valve. It descends on the anterior surface of the heart in the anterior atrioventricular groove between the right atrium and the right ventricle. As it, when it reaches the margin of the heart, it gives off a marginal branch which runs along the lower margin of the heart. Then it turns underneath and goes posteriorly on the undersurface of the heart, giving off this posterior interventricular branch on the undersurface of the heart, which I've indicated in a dotted line. Now, the left coronary artery arises from the left posterior surface of the ascending aorta, again just above the aortic valve. It comes round onto the front of the heart. We can just see it in that corner there. And then it goes on round the posterior surface, lying between the left atrium and the left ventricle, and I've dotted its position coming round here and anastomosing the right coronary artery. However, just as it's passing earned, round in this manner, it gives off the anterior to ventricular artery, which passes down here, supplying both the left ventricle and the right ventricle, reaches the apex of the heart, turns underneath, and comes back and anastomoses with the posterior to ventricular artery. So there is an important circulation which supplies the muscle of the heart and the important thing about it is that these arteries and their branches are end arteries, and should they be blocked by a thrombosis, then the myocardium, the heart muscle, which it supplies, will die. Well, having uh, got to this stage, I think we should continue down with some of our nerves. Let's take the phrenic nerve on this side. The phrenic nerve comes down here, and of course it passes in front of the root of the lung, whereas the vagus on that side has gone behind the root of the lung, and it comes down on the side of the pericardium. See, over the pericardium, it's covering the left ventricle. This is the left ventricle here. And on reaching the apex of the heart, it comes down and supplies the diaphragm. On this side, we see it emerging from behind the vena cava, coming down on the right side of the heart, separated from the right atrium by the pericardium, and then coming down and supplying the right cupola of the diaphragm. Well, now we're in a position, I think, to close off this pericardium completely. Uh, before I do so, realize that the whole of the surface of the heart here is covered with this visceral serous pericardium. And note that the visceral serous pericardium comes as a sleeve around the pulmonary trunk and the ascending aorta. Please note that the whole of the ascending aorta 
is within the pericardium. It is enclosed totally within the pericardium, fibrous pericardium. Uh, now, to be absolutely accurate, I must put in, of course, the, over that, the parietal layer of serous pericardium. And finally, cover the whole thing over with the fibrous pericardium. So there is now the heart contained within the per fibrous pericardium. You may well ask, what is this pericardium attached to, this fibrous pericardium? Well, below it is attached uh, in the midline to the central tendon of the diaphragm. In front, it is attached by sternopericardial ligaments to the back of the sternum. And above, it is a continuous with the predracheal fascia, which is coming down from the neck. Well, having got so far, I think it would be interesting to just indicate to you uh, the position of the thymus. The thymus gland occupies this region coming down in sort of two lobes lying in this region in front of the great vessels and even coming down in front of the pericardium. And finally, I think we can put in the region of the sternum. We can put the sternum in front here Realizing that it's, oh, this is the body of the sternum, here, and here is the xiphoid coming here. So now, if it was a transparent sternum, you can see that lying behind it is the pericardium, and the heart contained within it, and then behind the upper part of the sternum, where the uh, maneuvering sternal junction is occurring, which is about here, is the maneuvering, uh, we have the arch of the aorta, and the great veins. So let us just erase the structures that lie behind the sternum. We've now erased the structures that lie behind the sternum. So that we have here the maneuvering sterni, which unites with the body of the sternum at the sternal angle. And we have below the junction of the body of the sternum with the xiphoid. Please note that the right margin of the heart is projecting about a finger's breadth to the right of the right margin of the sternum. And the left margin of the heart projects over to the apex of the heart, which normally lies in the fifth left intercostal space, three and a half inches from the midline. So I think it's interesting to see the relationship of the heart within its pericardium to the sternum. Now, rather than attempt to build any more on this diagram, let me now redefine for you the mediastinum. If we look at a sagittal section of the thorax, and I'll just indicate the vertebral column behind, like that, indicate in front the manubrium of the sternum, Articulating with the body of the sternum, articulating with the xiphoid cartilage. And put in below the diaphragm, arching over and passing down as it arises from the front of the vertebral column in the lumbar region. Then we can see, if this is in the sagittal plane, this is the inlet of the, th of the thorax, the upper margin of the mediastinum. This area here, between here and the diaphragm, is the mediastinum. We arbitrarily divide up the mediastinum into a part that lies above the manubrium sternal angle, called the superior mediastinum, and a part that lies below this level, called the inferior mediastinum. And I would emphasize that this sternal angle lies on the level of the second costal cartilage. Second costal cartilage, manubri sternal angle. And it passes back, and it passes between the disc of T4 and 5, between the fourth and fifth thoracic vertebra. So this is the superior mediastinum, and this area, coming right the way down to here, 
is the inferior mediastinum. Now, if we put the heart in position within its pericardium, then we have a middle mediastinum occupied by the pericardium and the heart, an anterior mediastinum which lies between the sternum and the pericardium and in which lie such structures as the thymus and areolar tissue, and a posterior mediastinum which contains such structures as the descending thoracic aorta, the esophagus, the vagus nerves, the thoracic duct, and the sympathetic trunks. So here's the superior mediastinum, here is the inferior mediastinum. We divide the inferior mediastinum up into an anterior mediastinum in front of the pericardium, a middle mediastinum, which is the pericardium, and it's enclosing the heart, and a posterior mediastinum that lies between the heart and the vertebral column. Note that this goes all the way down the back of the diaphragm. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.